Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Maciek Jacek as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Poland, Maciek is currently based in New York City. His work is primarily focused on society's relationship with nature and questions of identity, representation, and the self. In 2012, his long-term project, Bypassing the Rational, was given a solo exhibition at Daniel Cooney Gallery in New York. Recent group shows include Image Nation 2017 at the Espace des Arts Saint Frontier in Paris, Currents 2013 at the Contemporary Art Museum in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Under My Skin at the Flowers Gallery in New York. Clients include IDO, AT&T, Philips, Adidas, Elysium Health, Time, Vice, The New Yorker, GQ, The New York Times, Wired, Adweek, New York Magazine, Refinery29, and Fast Company, among many others. Please help me welcome Maciek Jacek to our lecture series. Um, I came to New York about 12 years ago. Um, I came here not knowing really anything about photography, anything about lighting, and um, I had to kind of go on a journey uh, with photography um, that you guys might be on in yourselves at different stages. So um, mostly I'll be talking about a lot of the painting that started, but as the talk kind of goes on, I'll talk about like, you know, why I make images for myself, because each of you have your own reasons for making images. And I'll be very clear that I think anyone who does make images should think very clearly about why they make images, um, what do the images mean to them, and what do the images mean to the rest of society. So I just want anyone looking at these images to, to think about yourself, you know, what does this mean for me? Um, so my, my journey with photography started with, with assisting a lot of fashion photographers. And so um, when we would have some time off, um, we would end up going to some of the museums uh, in different cities that we were in. So when I was in London, I went to the post-impressionist room. And for whatever reason, that day, the experience was really resounding to me. And I just started looking at a lot of painting and thinking about, like, why is it this kind of painting is so powerful to me? Um, and uh, this is Cezanne. And um, why do these paintings mean so much more to me than other photographs? So I started thinking about color and focus. And you know, is it that if there's less information, does that sometimes make an image more powerful? Um, and why do certain colors have an effect on people? Um, why do certain colors have an effect on me? And I just started like having that kind of conversation with myself and thinking, OK, if I like all these things about painting, um, what can I do in photography that might be the same, that might elicit a lot of the same effect? Um, and at the time, I still really didn't know what I was doing, which at, th at the time I thought was a negative, but actually turned out to be a positive. Because when you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to think like, well, I shouldn't do this. You're just going to do whatever you think is possible. So you'll just start doing things. Um, and so for me, it was like, OK, let's, let's look at all this painting and see what it leads to. Um, so a lot of that was post-impressionist painting. The person who became like a really huge influence on my work was Francis Bacon. Uh, he was a very like troubled um, soul in um, the 20th century for painting. And his paintings can be very dark and kind of foreboding. But what I noticed about his work is he would use color in a way to kind of draw you in. So even if the subject matter was very intense and dark, he would find ways of using color and shape in really interesting ways. Um, and he, like especially for this image in particular, all these like really beautiful, bright colors bring you in. And then you notice that in the center is this very kind of like gnarled, um, kind of mangled uh, shapes in the center. And so he found a way to kind of create a balance between those two things. Um, and he kept on going back to this. And this is a painting of Pope Innocent X, which is his favorite painter was Velazquez. So he would look to Velazquez, just like I looked to him, as kind of an inspiration. Um, and he would do all these different things with focusing on like teeth. Um, he would focus on like slabs of meat and other things. So I just thought, OK, I'm going to use this person as a kind of guide to be like, OK, what are the things that I'm attracted to, and what can I use? So I started doing these portraits. Um, 
in, in my, my Bushwick loft over 10 years ago and just started using color and putting colors in front of the lens and using different kinds of like motion, long exposure, shorter exposures, just doing all sorts of things just to see kind of what would happen. And I would just find either friends or friends of friends or people on Craigslist who would just come in and I would just see what would happen. And I would give myself like an hour, hour and a half. Um, and it was a really great journey because I didn't have any expectations. And that's something else that I would really recommend is oftentimes we are living in a society that kind of demands immediate um, results where you feel like, well, if I put in this work, I want to have it, something to show somebody so I can get likes or get some approval. I really highly um, regard, regard, do, do not regard that highly. Um, I think if you can create work without expectations, you free yourself of that burden of like thinking that this has to be great or this has to be something I can show. If you can create work where you have no expectation, you will really free yourself. So I did these portraits for several months and um, I didn't expect anything of it. I really had no idea where this was going because I just thought that this had no application anywhere, that nothing would ever come of this. Um, and I just would allow, allow myself to kind of go into these weird um, terms where I would ask somebody like, well, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? And early on, I had a very strong dedication to doing everything in camera because I felt like that process of being with somebody, being in an environment, doing that in the moment was just so much more creative because it forced you to think on the fly and to collaborate with someone else and ask them like, can you do this? And they ask you a question, so it becomes a kind of a dialogue. And the resulting work is a kind of representation of this dialogue. Um, and so I would ask people to go kind of all out. Um, and one of the other painters that I found was more contemporary painter. His name is Odd Nerdrum. As his name implies, very strange painter. Um, makes all his own paints, does like really strange work. But what I liked about his work is he did these really strange floating bodies in this like alternate universe. So I thought, well, why don't I create my own alternate universe? So I started doing kind of nudes in my apartment that were kind of based on the same ideas as the portraits. Um, and I would have people do different kinds of jumps. And I would tell them, like, I don't want you to be jumping. I want you to be falling, or, like falling into like a, an abyss or a pool or whatever you wanted to think of. Um, because I noticed that once you start shooting, you realize, like, oh, that looks, that, that tends to look like sculpture or that looks like dance. And you realize, like, when something is kind of familiar to you, a lot of times you kind of turn off because you realize, like, oh, that looks like dancing or that looks like sculpture. I wanted to create things that kind of didn't look like anything, that you really didn't know what was happening. So then I realized like the power of mystery becomes really important. Um, because if you can create a mysterious image, that person will stay with that image for much longer. Um, so I kept on trying to experiment with, OK, maybe I now know what I want to do, but how do I translate this to someone else? Because someone like this person, this person was a dancer, so they could kind of understand what I was going for, but someone else may not know. So that became a really interesting evolution in photography where it was like, OK, I may know what I want, but how do I explain it to someone else? Um, and that became interesting where some people I could tell them directly, but other people I had to go kind of a very indirect route where I had to tell them to do something like a physical action that by itself like didn't mean anything. But in a split second in a photograph, it would like end up being something. So. I kept on going back and forth between the nudes and the portraits, and I got a little bit better with the portraits. And that's another thing that I like to come back to is that a lot of times if you do something a few times, you might feel like, well, this is as much as I'm going to get out of this. I highly recommend doing something 100 to 200 times because if there's something in value in it, you will find it within doing something over and over and over again. Um, and from that, I was able to learn so much more than if I had stopped it after 10 or 20. Like I've done 165 of these portraits and I still have to continually push myself to find like, okay, what am I gonna do this time that I didn't do last time? Whether it's through casting or through color or through lighting. So that's what I recommend to anyone doing photography is keep doing that same thing over and over and over again because you will find more within that and more within yourself. Um, and the more I did it, I did start promoting the work and that's why I started getting commercial work. Um, 
so some of you guys will know that this is Senator Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. And so this was a very good education in terms of doing commercial photography. I showed up on time and I did some lighting tests with the assistant and afterwards waited three hours for him to show up. And then once he did show up, we got five minutes to shoot with him. And then once he was done, he was done. He gets up and walks away from you and that's it. And if you don't have the photograph by then, you're screwed. So that was a really interesting recommendation of like, okay, you have to be prepared and you have to be ready that someone is going to show up whenever they want and they'll leave whenever they want and you have to be ready. Um, whereas when I did the projects at, at, in my house, when somebody was just jumping around in my apartment seemingly for hours, it, that didn't matter. So I had to become much better at understanding, well, well, what am I doing and how am I doing it? So my next challenge was I shot this for New York Magazine, maybe in 2013, 2014, and basically I had to do the same thing I did for full bodies, but this time with clothes. So I had to tell the model and the stylist and everyone else kind of what I was trying to go for. And initially, I didn't really make it as weird as I could have, and they actually pushed back at me, and they were like, listen, we want this to be as weird as all your other work, <laughs> um, which I really didn't expect and kind of threw me for a loop. Um, but that really taught me a lot about kind of knowing, you know, what is it that they want from me? Um, because as an artist, you often might feel like I can't do the thing that I do in a commercial setting. So you have to kind of figure out, like, can I do what I want here or can I not? Because sometimes you will be able to and sometimes you won't. Um, so the more I did these portraits, the more I learned about how to do this faster and more efficiently. And I would kind of come up with templates where I'd be like, okay, these are the colors that work really well here, so then I can apply them to a commercial um, photograph. This was an assignment for Wired. This is a photographer named Daniel Arnold. Um, and this was really nice assignment because these people just came to my apartment and I, we had like a couple hours to shoot with them. Um, this woman, Mimi Goodwin, I had to go to her place in California, but that also taught me like whatever you have in your comfortable space, you have to be able to translate to another place a place that's maybe not familiar to you, that doesn't have all the resources that you need. So you have to figure out, okay, what do I need to be able to do what I do anywhere in the world? Um, this is an artist named Megan Signoli. And this was also interesting because usually I'm very excited to show people the portrait. And I wanted to show her the portrait I did of her. And she said to me, she's like, listen, I'm not interested. And I was like, oh, why? And she's like, because it'll ruin my day. <laughs> And it wasn't because she would dislike the photo. She hated photos of herself. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of realize that that might happen. And it's not personal. It has nothing to do with you. Um, as I was doing this kind of work, I realized, OK, the work that I'm interested in is color. So what are all the different things I can do with color? Um, and I started working with color smoke, something that became, I think, pretty trendy a few years ago. Um, and I, whatever I would have an assignment in different places, this was shot in Minneapolis. I would try to find a way of us using smoke in a different location and try and find like different ways of combining like movement and color and other things. Um, this was shot in Los Angeles. Um, me and my friend had been shooting in the hills in Los Angeles and we saw this amazing like 70s car. So we just threw a smoke canister underneath it and he just rolled around on the, on the hood of the car and then we drove away really fast. Um, <laughs> I highly, I can't say I highly recommend. I tend to do these types of things, but I really recommend that you always ask for permission, but sometimes it's not always possible. Um, what you choose to do is going to be your choice. Um, so I, I had done some of this smoke stuff. I had done all my color work, and that led to this assignment for Ad Week. They sent me to Facebook headquarters to photograph the um, head of Oculus Rift at the time, this guy named Palmer Lucky. And so we did the color portrait, and then I had shipped to the Facebook headquarters um, smoke balls and a FedEx envelope. Technically, you're not supposed to do that, but they got there safely. So while we were doing the shoot, I approached them. I was like, listen, I want to shoot the smoke stuff. Would you be interested? He said, hell yeah. I love fireworks. Let's do this. And the good part was that you can see the, the kind of tube that was there. They actually do a lot of soldering there. So that was meant to like soak up a lot of the smoke. So it was actually like the perfect environment to do the shoot. Um, and so I was able to kind of do something that like would seemingly be impossible, but I asked. 
and the person was totally into it. So I always recommend asking. You may not always get a yes, but um, I got to do something that probably no one else will ever get to do. So um, it feels pretty great to be able to do that. Um, while I was doing all the portraits and nudes, um, I started doing stuff in landscapes. So I started going out to Las Vegas and to Death Valley in California and trying to find ways of reinventing both places because both places are really kind of iconic. Um, and I wanted to find ways of showing Las Vegas in a different light. And one of the things I found was that Las Vegas has all these strange trees that are just in the middle of these empty lots. So I was like, okay, this is going to be how I do this. So I found a way just by doing the same thing I did, just putting colors in front of the lens and reinventing this place. Um, and that, that's what the whole series is about. But what I learned about that was I could take all those same technical concepts of putting colors in front of the lens and also reinventing interiors. So this was an assignment for the New Republic magazine shooting Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the Supreme Court. Um, this was another interesting lesson in working commercial photography. The Amtrak train was over two hours late. I had an assistant set up everything beforehand, thankfully, but once I got there, we only had a few minutes. And I talked to our staff and I said, listen, my train was two hours late. You know, can we po postpone this by a few minutes? They said, absolutely not. Her schedule is absolutely rigid. You have to shoot now. So I had to shoot both this shot and the cover in 15 minutes. And you realize that you have to know exactly what you're doing and how to do it and also not be stressed out, not look like you're stressed out, and be able to shoot somebody who's ostensibly very famous in their environment um, your way, the best of your ability. So that was a really big challenge and a very difficult shoot. Um, so I kept doing these types of shoots in Death Valley and going out to Death Valley and finding ways of reinventing this landscape. And again, all in camera and dealing with all of the conditions of whether, like I had to shoot this shot in the car through the window because it's so windy in that part of Death Valley that it would rip the colors from, the, from in front of the lens. So I was like, okay, I can't do what I usually do. I have to find a new way of doing this. Um, so I use those same techniques, and this was a uh, commission for Wired UK, and it was shooting um, a company that did um, artificial intelligence that had just been recently bought by Google. So they wanted me to shoot these guys and kind of reinvent their, their, their environment, because it's just a really boring office. Um, and also, this was the founder of the company, and kind of reinvent and make him kind of look futuristic. So. It turned out that something that I had kind of developed on my own had all these different uses that I never really imagined it would. Because for me, I was just interested in painting and trying to make photography look like painting. And it turned out that this whole other world was opening up to me. Um, this was an assignment for Fast Company, shooting a scientist and, um, that was working on fighting Ebola with, with tobacco. But thankfully, right outside his house, there was basically a desert. So he was able to drive me around in his pickup truck and we were able to shoot in the desert, which was amazing. Um, so a lot of times you get these assignments where you get to go in a new environment and then you get to decide right then and there, okay, what can I do this environment? And there is that pressure of you have to make a decision like right away, but you also get to make pictures spontaneously, which is a really cool thing. And it really teaches you a lot about yourself and what's important to you. Um, so I had worked a little bit with smoke, but I had an idea that I wanted to put smoke into different arenas. So I tried a couple of times with fruits outside and it was a total failure. And so I was like, well, let me try it indoors and see what happens. And it became this really huge, long project that I'm still working on. And it's um, a really interesting project of realizing, okay, how many different ways can I do the same thing? Where if I'm interested in reinventing faces or bodies or landscapes, what other tricks and tools can I use? So I started applying this to these different fruits and figuring out, OK, what does this fruit look like? What can it look like? What colors work with it? And I would have to shoot these fruits sometimes 10, 15 times in a row. Um, and oftentimes, the smoke is going in the wrong direction. It completely invades the, the lens, or it, it barely goes anywhere because these are made in like a factory somewhere, and there's no quality control. So it really taught me about how to not give up, to figure out what colors work well with each other. Because I've never been to art school. I've never taken a color theory class. I don't really know anything about color. 
So I had to kind of figure these things out on my own. Um, that project did really well online. People really liked it. So I got a job with a company called Ideo, and they just liked the creativity of my work. So they said, well, just come and work with us on this project. It's about the future of food, and we'll figure it out. And we did all these really cool shots of, I mean, we did a lot of stuff that week, but this was my favorite aspect of that, of combining different types of, of parts of the, of the food world and creating these really strange combinations. Um, that's a chicken foot and something called Buddha's fingers, which are not actually edible, but they're really cool looking. Um, and that was a really great assignment because it was finally able to work with people who were just purely creative. And I'll never forget what the art director said to me when I was, you know, working on the first day and I was a little nervous about the shoot. I asked, like, well, you know, is the client going to like what we're doing? And he said, listen, the client will do like whatever I tell them to like, which was incredible because this guy was so confident in his position. And you felt like, wow, if he's so confident, then I can really feel comfortable shooting with this person. So I shot with them again a year later, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, I started working also with different kinds of lights. So I had been using the same lighting setup for years, and based on a recommendation from some people, I had started using these different kind of hot lights. So that opened up a whole other world to me of using different lights and different colors on these lights, and using colors in front of the lens, on the lights, and just overlapping everything. Um, and it really like gave me so much more opportunity. So I just realized something that I thought I'd pro would probably not even be still going. This was five or six years after I had already started doing this project. This project kept going, and it was really incredible. Like, how does this keep going? Um, this led to an assignment shooting for the small magazine called Open Lab and shooting Aesop Ferg. And um, it was cool to work with, because I'd work with a lot of politicians and other people, but it's fun to work with musicians because they're a lot more open to doing different things visually. And... Um, he was just a really cool person to work with. And this led to uh, another musician, her name is Ariana the Rose, and she, had a, she was very open about how she wanted to use color in the photography for her work. Um, so we had done a music video out in California, and I also did some of the stills for it. And we just used like this really beautiful environment, and we found a way to put her and the other person who was in the music video with her into these stills. And I also did um, a color portrait of her. So she brought kind of her own aesthetic, and we kind of merged our aesthetics. So that became an interesting thing of finding different ways of merging what someone else wants with something that you yourself are creating. Um, this was an EP cover for a guy named Young Paris. Um, this was a, a fun shoot to do, but the interesting story behind this is that I had shot a band called Lady Moon and the Eclipse years before. And they had almost no money, and I had met them through a friend of a friend. And I had shot with them, and then I had shot with one of the members in the band. I had shot her album cover. And then Young Paris is her brother. They're from this huge Congolese French family. They're all musicians, and they're all really interesting and creative people. And so it showed me, like, even if you meet somebody who you think that, you may not think that they're anybody, that this shoot will not lead to anything. You never know actually where things will end up. So it's always really important to be open to opportunities and to be open to what can happen in the future. Um, after doing all of that, I started working with uh, dif different kinds of fireworks because I thought that might be an interesting angle. So this is, is a super simple shoot. This is just a sparkler that's in her mouth. And we lit the sparkler, and as it was coming down, like toward the end, you couldn't really see the, sp you couldn't see the sparkler anymore. So it's just this like light in her mouth. It seems really strange and surreal, but it's incredibly simple. So I started finding different ways of using these fireworks in ways that were in camera, but also would kind of reinvent this reality. Um, and I would shoot in a lot of vanity spaces because it turns out shooting fireworks indoors, nobody really wants you to do that. Um, and it's dangerous, and people have all these problems, and it, it's a real drag. So I started going to a lot of abandoned spaces to do this, and, uh, or going to industrial areas at night. Um, but when I was in Los Angeles several years ago, I ended up going, excuse me, um, I'm going to open this on a different player. I found an abandoned mall. Um, I did a lot of research about Los Angeles, like different places in Los Angeles that I could shoot in. And I went there and I shot with a model. 
and um, it only turned out because we actually had to break in and as we were breaking in security guard caught us and he was escorting us out of the building and he asked us like what are you guys doing here and we told him listen we want to do a shoot um, with smoke and he's like wow really smoke like do you have any of these smoke canisters with you and I said yeah I do he's like light one off right now so I lit one off and there were these beautiful as you'll see in the video these beautiful skylights and you could see these like beams of light and he's like wow that looks awesome <laughs> And I was like, this is, I, I was like, this is unreal. And he's like, listen, just uh, give me a donation and you can shoot in the mall anytime you want. So I shot there with the model and then I came back two more times and we shot this video. And it was incredible because we had a gigantic mall. Like this, this is a mall that's been used in like a Beyonce video. It's been used in Gone Girl and lots of movies. And I was able to use it because basically like I just was able to form a relationship with this guy on the fly. Um, so I'm going to show you the video right now. And this was the first video I ever did. I um, didn't go to film school. I, it was me, the actor, and the cameraman. I edited myself. I color graded myself. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just kind of learned on the fly. So I emphasize anyone that says, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, it's not, it's not an excuse. Um, so that, that, that entire thing was shot in four hours. So um, it, it can definitely be done. Um, so learn, learning from that, um, I learned how even if I don't really know the technical aspects, it's not really a, an obstacle. There's always a way to do things if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Just do it, and then you'll figure it out later. Um, once I made that video, then I became friends with the band um, in Brooklyn named Girly Boy and I was able to convince them to make a couple music videos and we made both of these we made two music videos in one day and then we had to come back and shoot more footage for this one that time this time I didn't have to edit it anymore I didn't have to color grade it anymore and I had a friend who I had known for years who actually became my DP and he helped me out a lot with the shoot um, so this one kind of combines some of the fireworks stuff I'll show you this one as well
Um, so if you ever ask somebody if you can strap fireworks to them and they say yes, you should definitely do it. Um, that was uh, a real education because it's when you're collaborating with someone who ostensibly is your friend, is a creative person, um, be ready for a lot of conflict. Um, there was a lot of conflict between myself and the singer and the editor. Um, and it was very difficult to put everything together, especially since I had paid for everything and they hadn't paid for anything. So it was a lot of conflict that we had to kind of work out. And even now, like they still don't like the end of that video and we had to kind of tack it on against their wishes. So um, that's, there's, there's a beautiful side to collaboration and there's also the ugly side. So you have to kind of realize that both of those things are gonna happen. And in the end, you're gonna have to find a way to make it work. So I used the fireworks because it was a way to um, kind of reinvent reality. And um, that did have a commercial application. I was able to do a video later, which I'll show you guys. Um, but that wasn't happening yet. Um, I had continued doing these fruits, and I had to find more and more and different ways of doing fruits um, because this would lead to more stuff for IDEO. And this was a really interesting project for IDEO because we would have any of the amount of vegetables and fruits that we wanted, but we had to find new and different ways of kind of reinventing how fruits and vegetables would look. And amazingly, the way this company idea works is that really like I couldn't even tell who's the boss, who, who's in charge. Everybody just seems like they're totally cool, creative people. It's like this unbelievable place. And so we would just shoot in this photo studio and people would just come downstairs and ask like, hey, what are you guys doing? 
And we're like, oh, we're doing this. And they're like, oh, what have you thought about doing this? So this guy who was like an intern came down. He's like, oh, I have these LED lights. Do you want me to bring them down? I was like, yeah, definitely. And we found ways of putting these little LED lights inside of these fruits and vegetables and lighting them up. And we basically put them like through the paper underneath the table. Um, so it was this incredible like creative collaboration that kind of happened on a, like a whim. Um, so I just loved working with them and I loved working in that environment. Um, and that led to, this is the last video. Um, this led to um, kind of, we, they did this pro program called Food Future and they wanted to promote Food Future. So they, we did all of these images. It was a, it was a program pr sponsored by Target and MIT. And so we ended up doing this video in Vermont in the middle of the winter. So what started as just a skateboarding video I made with my friend two years before became um, like this video for um, this company's campaign for these two companies to, to do together. So it just taught me like if you have an idea, go for it because you never know where it's going to end up. Um, and conversely, when I did the fruits, I never imagined that I would have to very carefully blow up these smoke balls right behind a $10,000 handbag. Um, and that was its own challenge because before I would just destroy these fruits, but this time I really couldn't. Um, so that was just another interesting challenge that happened. And I just really began to appreciate like, you know, um, how many different directions this kind of work can go in. Um, so I kept on, at the same time as doing all these projects, I kept on doing um, my nudes and other things. And amazingly, the same magazine, it's called Fashionable Lampoon from Italy, um, I was able to do the nudes. Well, there's also a fashion component, but I was able to do a set of nudes. And the great thing was I was able to hire who I wanted. So the best model that I knew was my girlfriend and creative partner, Erica, who's in the audience in the back. And it was great to basically do an art project that I had always been doing with my favorite person and do it exactly like I wanted and have it published, which was great. Um, and we were able to basically do whatever we wanted. The art director was there, and anytime we did anything, he's like, yep, oh, looks great. So that was really nice. Of course, that, that was basically a shoot done for free, but it showed you, like, showed me if, if I want, there's, there are those abilities that I can do exactly what I want and get it published out in the world. Um, so at the same time, I kept on doing more of these color portraits, and as I kept on doing them, I had a hard time finding new ways of and reinventing things. So I started working with prisms, again, due to the same person, Erica, introducing me to prisms. Um, and I started trying to figure out different ways of using them because at first it seemed almost impossible. Like, what can I possibly do with this thing? And I kept on doing it, and that led to um, getting, I had done portraits for GQ before, but this was a really interesting project. Um, for a guy named T. LaRock, who was a MC in the mid-80s, who had been, who, who suffered a brain injury in the early 90s and completely lost his memory. So my assignment was to how to characterize him in these pictures to show this kind of two identities that he had. One where he like had no knowledge of himself, and the other one is this, him as this famous MC that was basically like one of the first rappers to work with Rick Rubin in like 1985. So that meant that you know, I had to use all these tools at my disposal to find a way to create the story. Um, and this was this is one of my favorite color portraits I've been able to do. It's for The New Yorker, which is one of my favorite magazines. And just being able to do this assignment and kind of do whatever I wanted is just, I feel very lucky to be able to do that. Um, so this is, I'm going to kind of go back to painting for a little while. And um, because I keep looking at painting because the whole process of how you do things is a never-ending story. Like, your life as an artist is never-ending. 
who you are continually continues to evolve. So you have to continually think about who you are as you keep doing your work. And so for me, I kept on looking um, at painting as a kind of direction for where I could go. Because for me, I looked at these paintings, like this is an Italian painter named Nicola Samori, and his ability to create these like very weird and surreal and strange and like morbid portraits that kind of borrow from another time but feel very contemporary at the same time. Um, and I would look at these paintings and think, look, you know, what is powerful about these paintings? How do they obscure identity? How much can you obscure someone's face while we still have an emotional connection to them? Um, this is a guy named Dario Maglionico, and he does actually an interesting thing where he's kind of combining time. Like over time, he'll show somebody in an environment, and it really makes me think about, okay, what is possible in photography? Because if you just look at photography, there's a kind of limited world that you're drawing from. But for me to look at painting or for film, you're kind of opening yourself up to a whole other world. Um, this is a contemporary painting, Anthony Kudahi. Um, this is Daniel Pitkin. And they create these worlds unto themselves. And it just makes me think about, this is a guy named Adrian Jenny, um, the different things that you can do with color and with, by obscuring things. Um, this is a British painter named Ian Francis. Um, and he creates these totally amazing kind of semi-abstract, semi-realistic worlds. And so it makes me think, well, can I create a world that's semi-abstract and, and also real at the same time? Um, this is a British painter named Ryan Hewitt. And he is, does such an amazing thing of just using different shapes to make faces. And, and so he just breaks everything down to like these very simple basics. And this is back to Francis Bacon, one of his later paintings in the 70s. And again, it's so simple. It just uses like a few colors, a few lines, but somehow it's so interesting and beautiful and strange and alluring. So this is a project um, started a couple years ago called Deeply Ordered Chaos. And this is, uses all of the stuff that I used with color, but also with prisms. So it's my way of doing the same thing as all these paintings that I've loved for years. Could I create photography that is very much like the paintings that I love? Um, and it's grounded in reality, but there's these other elements that kind of push it beyond um, those realms. So that's where I started to push, like how much can I push? How much can I pull? Um, how much of a person should I show? How much can I obscure them? And it, it's become, a, it's an interesting challenge because you have to kind of build a black box because prisms reflect everywhere. And it's a very particular exercise, but it's, been very um, satisfying to me to do something that's as close to all the work that I love. Um, and it's also pushed me to try to find new ways of representing people um, and finding new ways of combining people that which I normally hadn't done before. And so when I would get assignment, I would say, well, let me work at the prism and see what I can do here. So this is for Fast Company. And this, again, it's a more conservative approach to what I do, but it gives me an extra tool to use. Because when you're in a commercial space, you have a certain amount of time to do something interesting. So you have to think, OK, what can I do in this space with this amount of time that's interesting or different? Um, and that's the challenge, and it's an interesting challenge. So for me, over the years, it's been about how many different tools can I um, gain that I can pull out whenever I need to. And that gives you so much of an edge in commercial photography. Um, this was an assignment for a company called Yummy Colors. They're a design company, and they just wanted really interesting portraits of themselves. And so they just came to the studio, and they were just very open to doing different interpretations of themselves. Um, this entire effect that you see is just lip balm. That's it. That's all you're looking at. Um, it's so incredibly simple. I won't go into how incredibly frustrating it is to use. But it's, it shows you that you can just use different types of emulsion, different types of materials, and put them in front of the lens and completely reinvent something. So I did this for them. And then I also did this for um, the cover of a financial magazine called Barron's, which is about the use of AI in financial matters. So again, it's something that you kind of go on a lark, you try it out, you see where it goes, and it ends up being this whole other tool that you never even thought possible. Um, and this was just a few months apart. So it was a really interesting development for me, and I found it really um, lucky to have kind of stumbled upon it. Um, another thing that I've thought about is, okay, 
if everything that I do is about color, how many different ways can I use color? And this is another in-camera technique that I use, um, and I've used it. Um, this is all natural light. There's no lights involved here whatsoever. There's no Photoshop. There's nothing. This is just natural light. This is how it looks straight out of the camera. Um, and it was a really cool thing for me to do that, you know, if it's a sunny day, I can just do this really quickly, really easily. Um, and um, this is Erica again. This is when we were in Portugal. So we would find this abandoned place, and then I could basically kind of match the colors of the lance of, the, of this place onto her. Um, and it, it became just another fantastic tool to, to have. Um, and just, and you realize it's just such a simple thing of just putting a few colors on someone's body or someone's face that it kind of really reinvents the whole feel of something. So um, you have to really think about what are small things that you can do to an image that just tweak it one degree. Because I think a lot of people want to tweak it, let's say, 100 degrees or 180 degrees. But just think about really tiny things that you can do that will make a really big impact. So this um, is an assignment that I've done several times. This is a scientist named George Church. Um, the same friend that had used work for the New Republic now works for this company called Elysium. They're an anti-aging company, and they do portraits of different scientists. So I only have a couple hours, and I have to do several portraits. So we use the same technique that I used before. Um, thankfully, that day was sunny, and this day was also sunny. Um, but if it's not, I have all my lights and I have everything else. But if it is sunny, then I have this whole other technique to use. Um, and it does extraordinary things. This we actually shot while we were in Portugal. <clears throat> I had shot an assignment for the magazine in London. And sensibly, Eric and I were supposed to be on vacation. But the magazine said, like, well, we have this idea. It would be really wonderful if you could just do this hand with these colors. And so we would. And they'd say, well, that's really nice. We really like it. But do you think you could do it again? And then we'd shoot it again. They'd say, well, you know, that's really fantastic. But do you think we could do it again? And it became another lesson of like, oh my God, like I really want to make this client happy, but Jesus Christ, like they really need to stop pushing me because this is getting out of hand. Like I'm supposed to be on vacation and I can't keep shooting this over and over again. Um, in a sense, I have, still haven't learned this lesson because we just shot the covers of this Spanish band's EP four times because once again, they didn't really know what they wanted. But it also teaches you sometimes you want to shoot something multiple times and sometimes you have to say, OK, that, this is it. I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, one of the last things I've done in this last year was to use the prism outdoors in a landscape. This was shot in Utah in March. And um, it just involved a lot of things that I've done before. But it, the only thing that I'm doing is just I'm reflecting another part of the landscape into this landscape. Um, so it's a very simple in-camera technique that has allowed me to find a new way of doing landscapes. Because in a sense, just putting colors over the lens just became very rote and it became something that I just kept on doing and it was really no longer interesting to me. So I had to think of what else could I do to reinvent landscapes. Um, and this became a new thing. Again, really challenging, really difficult because you can hardly see what you're doing, but it gave me a whole new outlet. Um, this was um, something I just shot in Iceland um, using the same technique. And this was an interesting thing because usually when you're shooting a landscape, you're just seeing a landscape this way. You see it. And you can imagine like the framing of it. But when you're shooting this landscape, you're not shooting this. You're shooting what's over here, planted over here. So you have to completely rethink how you're seeing this, because you're not seeing it for what it is. You're seeing it for what this is over it. So it's a really interesting challenge. And then if you want to make it more challenging, you put somebody into that landscape. So you put somebody over here, and then you have to kind of meld them into this landscape. This is Erica again. So. This became a new challenge. So the interesting thing is the journey that you are on photography, just enjoy the journey because it's kind of an endless journey. And as if you're really relentless and really consistent, you'll find new doors will open up to you the more you work and the more you try different things. So no matter how many years you've been doing it, I would always say try something new, try something different because maybe it's a dead end or maybe it's a dead end and there's a door that opens up underneath and then you fall down into it. Um, again, this is another shot from Iceland that we did in September. Um, and all that prism work led to uh, this assignment for the Atlantic magazine. I had to do an assignment um, doing portraits of trans youth. And for me, a lot of 
being trans involves identity and being kind of stuck between two identities. So when I told them, you know, I do this project and I, you know, do two, two different people, they were totally fine with it. And so I was able to do basically something that I thought was like a really wild art project and was able to get it into like a pretty mainstream magazine um, and to do like a, a nude that I would have never thought could be in a magazine and was able to get into this magazine. Um, and I wanted to be as respectful as I could for, some, for, for people who are very delicate about being shot because it's, their identity becomes very important. So it becomes very f important for you as a photographer to know when you're shooting somebody that you have to be really aware of how you're presenting them, especially for somebody who is very sensitive about how they look and how they're perceived. Um, the difficulty with this assignment was not on the photo end, which was fantastic. The difficulty was that the article was very much disliked by the trans community. So I actually became associated with the article and it became a very interesting, kind of difficult process of trying to separate myself from the article. Because as a photographer, you might unnecessarily get drawn in to being held responsible for the article or for the person you're photographing. Because if in today's day and age, if you photograph somebody like Donald Trump, you will be held responsible for deciding to photograph that person, which I think in the past you wouldn't be. So it's another thing you have to be aware of when you're a photographer of, it's not only what you're shooting, but who you're shooting and how you're representing them. Um, the last work that I've been doing is, um, I've started a studio space with Erica and we have a lot of plants. So that's the newest thing. We're using a lot of like plants and trees and tropical elements with all the colors and other things that we've been doing to add another element to our work. Um, so that's just the latest thing. I've, it's been kind of a strange thing to show people 10 years of my life. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I look forward to your questions. Um, I just want to let you guys know that I was where you are if you are near the beginning of your journey with photography. Um, I just want you to know that you don't have to worry about whether something's gonna be great just do what you want to do and just really think about what you're doing and really feel it. And if you do all those things, amazing things will happen. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. That was terrific. Um, I guess the question I have is that you do a lot of your work in camera. And I think you talk about it like, you know, kind of a proud thing about doing it in camera. And, and I look at a lot of your work and I say, well, you know, he could have done that in Photoshop if he wanted to. Um, and, and so I think there's this debate that goes around about it. Is doing a camera more artistic than doing it in Photoshop? I actually have my point of view on it. But I'm curious um, what you think about that whole thing and how your work relates to it. Um, for me, I just like doing things in camera. Um, it's a personal preference for me. But I think that there are really interesting things that can be done in post. Um, I think, do you know the, the artist Asger Carlson? He's, a, he's, an art, he's an artist who basically would take um, photographs that look like black and white snapshots, and he would use Photoshop to completely like, change the photograph. And it, in a sense, they would be almost really obvious Photoshop, like someone would have like four eyes. But because it was like a black and white snapshot, you'd be like, oh, I, I guess this is real. And so he kind of used our ideas of what we expect from Photoshop and what we expect from fake things. And he's like, he did super obvious things in a world where we didn't expect it to be fake. So I think there's a lot of room to do interesting things. It's just for me, I don't want ever to be like, oh, like this is art and this isn't art. Like that's kind of like a, a pointless question, I think, in a sense, because then you just end up having artists fight over what's real. And that's not what it's about. Um, you mentioned um, in one of the desert photos that you that the the color would literally come off of the camera. Are you putting gels directly onto the lens? I don't recommend doing that. I did it on, on a filter in front of the lens. But most of the other times you're doing it on the lighting itself. A little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. Uh, don't worry, I'm also afraid of making color work that's way too garish, so very often I have a lot of qualms about my own work too, so it's not just you. When you were talking about uh, strapping fireworks on your friends and collaborators, <laughs> uh, did, were you also taking out insurance uh, for yourself and the people involved, or was just roughing it? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm curious if you, you mentioned time and incorporating that element and time into it. 
and the smoke that you've been working with is is the perfect thing to use over time. Have you considered doing things like cinemagraphs or playing with the notion of part of the image being still, part of it being emotion, you know, letting that smoke kind of envelop a scene but keeping a model still or, or doing the opposite or slowing things down or speeding things up, time lapses, hyperlapses? I've, I've actually, I did, I've done a little bit with cinemagraphs for a client and then I have had people actually take my still images and animate the smoke aspect of it. So I've, 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 I've seen that in action. I'm not opposed to it. It's just for me, I don't, I don't know, I, I just, I kind of can't accept it. And I think for someone else, like I would be like, you know, go for it. But for me, like, it just doesn't feel like, I'm like, it's either, almost for me, I'm like, it's either a photograph or a film. And I get kind of weirded out when something's in between. Like, even some of those fruits, I thought about making gifts out of them. But then I was like, I don't want to kind of take away from the photographs. Like, I love the photographs and I love photography because it's like catching that moment. And when you give away too much time, I feel like some of that mystery goes away, especially with the fruits, where like when you see it, it looks funny, but it, it ends up looking like the fruit's vomiting, which is funny, but like it ends up kind of cheapening these images, which are like, I want these fruits to be these like weird monsters. And if I give motion to it, it just, it takes away from that. So I've seen, I've seen it done and I think there's ways of doing it well. I just haven't found a way to do it for myself. Can you talk a little bit about getting your work out in the world, like prospective clients, and what, what are some of your strategies? Um, so it's a really interesting world out there. Um, Ten years ago when I started, it was so simple where people, especially a lot of photo agencies still work this way, where they, okay, we'll, we'll print a book of all your stuff, we'll send out a ton of these books to different agencies and magazines, and then we'll get some work. And that's not really the way it works anymore because a lot of creative people find work in so many different ways. So it tends to be like if you contact someone directly, it can be a negative because they have like a stack of books or they have a stack of like flyers. So then you're kind of lost amongst that shuffle. doesn't mean your work's not any good, but it may not really be the best avenue. So what actually has worked out for me is that I have developed relationships or like I know people at different websites like there's a website called Boom, or there's a website called like It's Nice That. There's tons of these sites that basically show like cool projects that are being done all the time. So if you submit to them, there's a chance that your work will get picked up because they constantly need new content. Um, I highly recommend waiting until you are like absolutely ready to show something. Because if you're showing something that's like kind of not that great, they may be like, oh, is that person who sends this work that's not that great? And then they're not going to be as likely to send work to you. Um, the guy, you know, Jeff at Boom, like, I only really send him work when I'm, like, really send, ready to send it to him. And he almost always posts it because it kind of fits with what their aesthetic is. So what I would recommend is, like, whoever you look up to, find out, like, where they've been published. And then submit to those people. And submit to, like, smaller people because the world is so huge now. There's so many different, like, small magazines that getting published in a smaller magazine can lead to so much, something much bigger. Um, but it's just a frustrating thing because you basically feel like you're throwing like a little pebble into the Grand Canyon. Like you have no idea like is, is anyone seeing this? Is anyone reading this? Does anyone even care? So you just have to like be patient with yourself and just not expect things right away because it can be very stressful on yourself to be like, well, it's been a week. I haven't heard anything. Am I not a good artist? Am I not doing cool things? And you just have to be patient and just keep doing good work and know that Things will work out in the end, but it just takes time. And um, I do recommend developing as many positive relationships out in the world as possible, meeting people who are you know, curators, art directors, other people through all types of work. Not because you're like trying to get work all the time, because then you're gross and thirsty, but because you're just genuinely looking for interesting people that you want to collaborate with, where it makes sense for you to collaborate, not because you just want to be famous or you want to make money, which are like the wrong reasons to do things. When you submit your work, do you submit as well like um, a statement or a, uh, something written about that work or you just submit the photos or you... It depends on where you're submitting it to. Like if there's, if you see that other people like where you're submitting, they've had statements from people, you should kind of tailor your submission to them. Like let's say if a website just writes like a short paragraph, 
you may just want to write a short paragraph. So kind of go based on what they're doing. So just kind of make it as familiar to them as possible. Because I think also people just want to submit their work to as many people as possible. And I would say, like, be more selective and kind of fit in a little bit more with what people have done already on, on whatever the platform is. Thank you so much for a stellar lecture. Thank you.